This year we've had a very busy structural program at the Congress and it's my great pleasure to welcome some of my colleagues here today to talk about the highlights of the program. I have with me today from Montreal, I have Pascal Thériault-Lozier, I have Niccolo Piazza from Montreal as well and I also have Bernard Prendergast from London. Bernard, if I could start with you. TAVI, of course, is already a very established therapy. However, it would be great to hear from you what are the latest innovations in this field. So, as you say, Patrick, it's now more than 10 years since the first procedures and TAVI is an established uh, tool uh, for the clinical treatment of many more patients with aortic stenosis than even we envisaged two or three years ago. We now have new devices coming to market, four new devices in the last year and we have the third generation devices of the original uh, groundbreaking technology. We've seen data at this Congress which have outlined the ironing out of all the, many of the previous concerns regarding the uh, durability of the devices and some of the technical, uh, technological changes which required fine tuning to really optimize the clinical outcomes. So we've seen data, for example, with 90% one year survival with third generation devices, We've seen 1% and 2% stroke incidents at long-term follow-up. We've seen the virtual abolition of paravalvular leak as a, as a concern for the interventionists. And we've seen falling rates of pacemaker requirement in, in, in the large series. So the future is looking very, very positive for TAVI and for its continued expansion into intermediate and low-risk cohorts. So we've heard some excellent results from the established devices that are on the market at the minute. Perhaps tell us a little bit about the emerging devices that are coming through at this minute. Okay, so the, the main emphases now are on the uh, recapturable devices. Boston Lotus is maturing very fast. Uh, the retrievability, uh, the accurate position ability, the Symmetis valve, for example. And also the, the, the possibility that these devices may now become applicable for treatment of aortic regurgitation as well. And the Yenna valve is showing particular promise in that regard. So I see an expansion of this technology beyond aortic stenosis to encompass aortic regurgitation as well in due course. So some really exciting results in the field of aortic interventions. Nicolo, if I could ask you a little bit now, if, if TAVI is the established therapy, mitral valve replacement percutaneity is the new kid on the block. Can you tell us what's happening with mitral valve replacements percutaneously? Yeah, you're absolutely right. It is a new kid on the block, and uh, we're starting to hear of more first-in-human experiences. Um, and during PCR this year, we've heard that there have been four first-in-human devices that were implanted in, during the year of 2014. And at the moment, there's approximately 35 to 40 implants worldwide. Okay, and we've seen feasibility. Can you tell us anything about efficacy at this minute in time, or is it too early to say? Well, I think these first in human studies have clearly shown the proof of concept. Uh, we've uh, demonstrated that you can obtain uh, no paravalvular leaks after implant um, and stability of the device. Uh, one of the vexing issues in the field is patient selection and which patients would be best addressable with this therapy. So when we talk about patient selection, we're talking about the patient risk profile, the surgical risk profile, the anatomical criteria that we need to think about, and also the procedural risk, comparing, for instance, a transcatheter mitral valve replacement procedure versus a transcatheter mitral valve repair procedure. So we need to think about all of these uh, when selecting the right patient for these uh, replacement procedures. So clearly, some really early promising developments in the, in the percutaneous line of mitral valve replacement, but of course, we have to look after the whole of the left ventricle, and this is something that's a real challenge. I think this leads us quite neatly on to percutaneous heart failure therapies. Perhaps you could tell us a little bit about any developments we have at the Congress or in the past year or so on heart failure therapies percutaneously. Sure, there's been a number of uh, devices in the field. There's been a lot of innovation in the field of interventional heart failure. We're starting to hear of sensors being placed in the heart uh, for patients with heart failure. We're also hearing about devices help to treat uh, ischemic uh, and non-ischemic cardiomyopathies. Uh, and today we've seen uh, recent results uh, with a parachute device, a device that is intended to obliterate the apex uh, of patients with uh, apical scars. Uh, in order to improve uh, their left ventricular geometry and uh, furthermore uh, potentially reduce mitral regurgitation. 
So I'm sure, gentlemen, you'll absolutely agree the importance of imaging, pre-procedural and also procedural guidance is integral to the world and development of structural interventions. Pascal, perhaps you could tell us a little bit with your um, engineering background about what developments we see in this particular arena in structural imaging. Well, we've known for many years that uh, imaging is crucial to the sizing and patient selection for uh, structural heart interventions. We think about TAVI, uh, you know, outcomes have been affected by, by proper sizing with CT. And now with these new interventions that are, that are being developed for the mitral valve and, and for heart failure, uh, CT will for sure uh, play a crucial role uh, in those patients. And we've seen some abstracts presented on how to measure CTs uh, for those specific uh, interventions. And we've also seen uh, interesting results from, uh, from uh, companies that provide intraoperative imaging and fusion imaging, such as uh, the uh, Heart Navigator from, from Philips, uh, where, where more information is provided to the interventionalist during the intervention uh, in order to, uh, to really optimize the, the results. And I think the challenge, Patrick, now is to create a new dialogue uh, building on the, the partnerships we've already established between the interventionist and the imager, not only in the catheter lab, but in the planning procedure, in the case selection uh, process, because it's going to be vital, not only for the best clinical outcomes, but also to harness these uh, very bright and exciting uh, technological developments over the next five years or so. Can you perhaps, Bernard, see a new subspecialty of uh, interventional imaging specialists to help us with these procedures? I, I think ab absolutely. That's going to be a fundamental requirement. You know, we, we need to uh, broaden the heart team even wider. We need to retain our partnership with surgeons as we do these innovative uh, left ventricular and mitral valve interventions together. But we need the help of our imaging colleagues to really guide us, not only in, in, in planning those procedures, but in performing them skillfully and successfully. Gentlemen, thank you very much indeed. So today you've heard very clear innovations both in the world of aortic valve interventions, mitral valve interventions, percutaneous heart failure, and in the exciting and developing world of interventional structure imaging. That's a wrap here today from EuroPCR. Thank you.